Hello physics students. In this video, we're going to do an experiment to test and see that momentum is conserved for a collision where one object moves into a second object that's at rest, and then it collides and sticks to the other object on impact, and then the two objects move off together. Now, uh, at this point, you should have already printed out the two sheets in the Google Stream, and this time you need to print everything out because the entire lab is the uh, data and calculations. To sh see that momentum is conserved, the equipment we're going to be using today, you can already see, is this long aluminum track with the two lab cars. One of the lab cars is uh, made more massive by the placement of an aluminum bar on top of it. This car is less massive because it has no aluminum bar. This car will come in and when it collides, the uh, sticking will uh, be created by two pieces of Velcro that are on the two cars and so they'll stick together on impact. Now, uh, in order to see that momentum is conserved, we need to determine the masses of the objects and the speeds, or I should say the velocities of the object before and after the impact because momentum is mass times velocity. Now the mass is easy enough to determine. I could just use an electronic balance. So I'm going to do that now. I'll take this car first and I'll put it on the balance. And what I get is 511 grams, which I write on my lab sheet now, a couple points, I need to convert this to kilograms first. So 511 becomes 0 0.511. And the second point is you're not writing that down because as usual, you're going to get your own mass assigned to you. You'll find that in the Google Stream. So I'll put this back here, ready for our experiment. And then let me get the other car. Put that on the balance, 255, I have to convert to kilograms. Again, you're getting your own values, and when you do get your own values, you're going to put them right here where I put my values. Right here, two places for the mass. Okay, so the next thing, we have the masses, now we have to get the velocities of the two cars. Now. We've used, in kinematics, the motion detector and in Newton's laws. Problem with this in the momentum uh, experiments is that the uh, motion detector will only see the car or the object directly in front of it. It will not be able to see the other car. The sound will echo here and no sound will be over here. So we won't ever register the velocity of this car. So what we're going to use instead of the motion detector, well, you can already see the photo gates here. So it's kind of like the uh, last lab we did with energy. And the similar problem that when this car rolls uh, past this photo gate, uh, it will not uh, trip the invisible beam over here, the infrared beam. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, as before, a plastic strip on this car that hangs off to the side so that when it reaches the photo gate, it will pass through the photo gate and register a time. So now that gives me a time, but I don't need time for momentum. I need velocity. So then I need a distance as well. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, after I run the experiment, I'll talk about what distance we use with the times we're going to measure. But what I want to do now is um, uh, reconfigure the camera so I could show how I set up the photo gates to operate for this experiment. Now we need to set up the photo gates in such a way that they allow us to determine the velocities before and after impact. So remember a photo gate is a device that creates an infrared beam, like a laser beam you can't see between this hole and that hole. And it measures the times at which that beam is interrupted. What we want to do is set it up in this experiment so that it starts timing the moment this plastic strip blocks the beam and stops timing the moment the plastic strip no longer blocks the beam. In other words, it's a stopwatch that'll start here 
and stop there. So in order to do that, we've got to start this program, allow it to initiate, and then we go to the setup menu here and we set up the timing and this is how we turn the photo gates on. Again, we want it to start timing when the photo gate becomes blocked and to stop timing when it becomes unblocked as this choice shows. So I did that, I turned photo gate one on, but this time I need two photo gates, one for before the impact and one for the after the impact. So I set the other one up, both are set up now, and now I just start the data collection and it's ready to go. Okay, so now that my photo gates are all set up, I'm ready to perform the experiment. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this blue car and I'm gonna give it a nice healthy shove so that it crashes into the red car and sticks to it and then the two will move on after the impact. So, here we go. So just visible on this screen, you could see at the extremes the two photo gates and the car resting here. What will happen is the blue car will come in and go through this photo gate first. And when it does, it'll trip that photo gate and give us a time right there, which will allow us to calculate the velocity of this car. And notice there's been no collision yet. So this is before the impact. Then they'll stick together and then they'll roll together through the second photo gate here and you'll see they'll trip through that one and give us a time there and that will apply to after the impact. So two times and uh, from that we'll be able to uh, do some calculations to see that momentum has been conserved. So let me reset things up and then we will run the experiment again in real time so you could see the data generated as it's happening. Okay, so I got the car here. Let me clear this. And I'm gonna give the blue car a healthy shove again. You'll see it crash, and then you'll see the times generated during the experiment. So here we go. Okay stop them and you saw this time generated here and that time generated there. Now you probably could read these but you're not going to write them down because um, it, it, you're going to be assigned your own times. And so in the Google stream you're going to look up these times. I'm going to just jot them down on a piece of paper right now just to uh, for reference later. So I got 0 0.01005, and that's in seconds. And this is 0 0.03027 seconds. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is reconfigure the camera and show you how you can use these times to verify that momentum has been conserved for this collision. All right, so here's my data so far. Before I continue, I just want to point out that I made a mistake when I was first copying the data. M1 uh, should be the mass of the car without the aluminum bar on it. When I measured the more massive car, the car with the aluminum bar on it, I put it over here when I first uh, performed the experiment. If you were following along and you put the more massive car here, you're going to have to switch these so that M1's the less massive car and M2 is the more massive car. Two masses, two times. Now remember the goal here is to show that momentum is conserved and momentum depends on mass and velocity. What I have here are times. That's not going to directly help me determine the momentum. I need to convert those times to a velocity. The piece of the puzzle that's missing is the distance that the car traveled during the time that it recorded in these two steps. So the distance was 
the thickness of the plastic, or I should say the width of this plastic strip. So that's what I have to measure my final piece of data. And it's a little bit hard because the camera's in the way, but just from what I see, I could see it's approximately maybe 1.60 is the uh, thick or the width of the card. I'm gonna write that as my distance here, 1.60, oh, I need that in meters. So let me convert that to 0 0.0 one six zero meters okay but again you're going to get your own distance from the Google stream now what I have is one distance and two times and somehow I have to calculate or determine four different velocities this is the velocity of car one initial before the impact car two initial before impact. This is the velocity of car one final, that means after the impact, and the velocity of car two final after the impact. To help you figure out how to determine these four velocities from just these two times in one distance, I'm going to show you the collision again in slow motion. Observe carefully. Now let me just point out that if you feel that the car's one of the car's velocities uh, at some point is zero. You do not have to show a calculation. You could just write V equals zero into the box and even though there's a lot of space, you don't have to show anything else other than that. If you've already calculated the velocity of a car, one of the cars in one situation and the other car at some, either at the same time or later time, has the same velocity as the, something you already count, calculated, you don't have to repeat that calculation either. You could just write V equals and then the answer, as long as you've already calculated it. But if you calculate the velocity, uh, uh, some other velocity, remember all calculations need three steps. You need an equation, then the substitution with units, and then the answer with units. So you'll be graded for having all three of those steps in the appropriate box. But again, two times, four velocities. So like I said, let's take a look at the collision now in slow motion to help you figure out all these velocities. This is the system before impact. You need to figure out the velocity of the blue car and the velocity of the red car before they even collide. This is the system after the impact. You need to figure out the velocity of the blue car and the velocity of the red car as they're rolling along after they crash. Well, hopefully what you just saw clarified things. Because again, you should now be able to calculate or determine the four velocities of the car. Car one, before and after. Car two, before and after the impact. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and determine those four velocities now. All right, the next thing that you have to do is you have to calculate the momentum of the system initial. That means before the impact occurred. So again, the system is both cars, but before impact, you've got to write out your formula and your calculations with all the appropriate numbers, one, two, or three, or four. Some of these velocities in this calculation, some or both masses in the calculation, and when you're all done, you should have P initial equals some number with the appropriate units. So go ahead and do that now. Okay, the next thing that you're going to do is number five, according to momentum conservation, what should the momentum of the system after the collision be? You're making a prediction. But again, it's not a prediction like with a crystal ball or something like that. You're not just throwing out a number. It's based on your 
understanding of momentum conservation in stuff that you've already previously calculated. Go ahead and make your prediction now. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we calculated the initial momentum, we calculated the final, or we, we predicted the final momentum, and now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the final momentum of the system. So show all work. So based on the masses and some or, uh, or all of these velocities that you calculated, calculate the momentum here. And show all work again means you got to show the nice process of putting a formula and so on and so forth. And then you're going to have a P final here uh, as an answer. So go ahead and calculate that now. Okay, number seven. Calculate the percent error between your initial and final momentum. Go ahead and consider this the accepted value. So when you're all done, you'll have percent equals and then an answer. So go ahead and calculate that now. Okay, the last question. The question reads, was momentum gained or lost in your collision? Now, of course, it should not be gained or lost. It should be conserved. They should be equal. Chances are it won't be. So here's what you have to do. You have to state two reasons for your discrepancy that are consistent with your observation of gain or loss and explain exactly how this factor contributed to your observed error. So uh, remember, this was uh, something that I talked about in the last lab, energy conservation, with the uh, coming up with errors. You can't say human error. You can't say, uh, oh, I must have punched the wrong buttons on the calculator. You can't say, oh, I must have rounded incorrectly. All those things, if you did indeed make those mistakes, you should go back and fix them. We're assuming you didn't do anything wrong with the numbers. So now you have to think about the setup and the way the experiment was executed and think of something that might have gone wrong. Remember, I listed a bunch of things that we do before an experiment, during an experiment. It could be something that you did indeed do wrong, but you can't just say human error and write those two words and be done. You have to explain exactly what you might have done wrong or what was not quite right in the setup of the experiment or the assumptions of the experiment, and then explain away. Another thing, if you have a momentum gain in the experiment, you can't list reasons why momentum was lost and vice versa. If your experiment showed that momentum was gained, you have to come up with reasons why momentum was gained, not lost. So do that now and uh, complete that. Uh, uh, now fill in your reason for the losses or gains. Okay, so that concludes our experiment, momentum conservation number one. As always, take photos of your two pages, submit them into the Google Classroom stream, and I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next physics video.